Chapter number seven of The Way to Willpower by Henry Hazlitt. Chapter seven The Scale of Values. In spite of the disclaimer at the end of my last chapter, I am sure to be accused, because of the satiric remarks preceding that disclaimer, of disparaging ambition. And I may not only be denounced for this, but I shall be told that of all places in which to disparage ambition, a book purporting to show the way to willpower is the strangest and most unforgivable. But I hasten again to assure the reader that I have not disparaged ambition at all. I have only disparaged ambitions. I have merely intimated that many of our ambitions are misdirected. We are worshipping false gods. A man in our day who laughs at the idea of taking seriously Zeus and Jupiter is not denounced as irreligious. In fact, he would probably be called irreligious if he did take them seriously. A time will come, I prophesy, when a man who bows down before our present popular conceptions of success will be denounced as lacking in ambition. But there is a liability to misunderstanding more important than this. Many will derive the idea from some of my past remarks that the only thing I regard of importance is what a man actually does and does not want, and that I am not concerned with what he ought to want. This is a misinterpretation which cannot be allowed to pass. I have not, and I cannot dwell at length upon what our ideals and aspirations ought to be. That is a subject for ethics, and I am talking of willpower. But for the sake of clarity, Perhaps it were well that I indicate my position on this point. We have seen that every ambition has its price, and that, before launching yourself formally upon the attainment of any ambition, you must first of all ask yourself whether it is worth its price. But the value of accomplishing an ambition, or the sacrifice involved in securing it, are not objective things. They exist in your own mind, and they may be changed in your own mind. An analogy will make this clearer. Whether or not you decide to pay $100 for an overcoat depends both upon the value you attach to the overcoat and the value you attach to the $100. The worth you set upon the coat will depend upon whether you are without an overcoat altogether or whether the one you have was acquired six years ago or whether you just bought an overcoat last week. The value you attach to the overcoat will also depend on whether you are enamored with the style of it or whether you laugh at the style of it. And such things depend quite as much upon your own tastes as they do upon the overcoat. The value you attach to the $100 will depend on whether you are earning $25 a week or $2,500 a week. Finally, the value you attach to the $100 and to the overcoat will depend upon your whole scale of values, your entire gamut of tastes and likes and dislikes, upon how many other uses you can think of for the $100 upon whether you attach more importance, say, to a $100 set of books, upon how much importance you attach to dress generally, and how much to money as a whole. In short, the value of a tangible object, unlike its weight, shape, and dimensions, does not inhere in the object itself. It inheres in you. The weight of a long ton of coal will always be exactly the same as the weight of a long ton of bricks, but the value of a ton of coal will not always be $15, either to you or to the community as a whole. Now, what applies to economic values applies with equal force to social and moral values, and I am here speaking of these values as they are, not according to any notions of what they ought to be. These two exist not objectively in the outward world, but in your own soul. When I advise you first to consider the price before setting out after any ambition, the decision you take may still differ from that of your neighbor, who takes similar forethought. Imagine two men, each able to foresee perfectly all the consequences of his actions, and each trying to decide whether to make it his ambition to amass a million dollars. The first may enjoy putting forth effort. He may relish competition and strife. He may be satisfied with a narrow and exclusive devotion to his business, and the attainment of a million dollars may seem to him an attainment glorious beyond all other attainments. It is not difficult to see that such a man would go ahead with the struggle for this object. But the second man, equally far-sighted, may be by nature more indolent or, though possessed of equal energy, 
he may have a wider range of interests. He may like pictures, music, literature, philosophy, travel, or women. The ambition for a million dollars may seem to him a ridiculous and childish ambition. He may feel that an income of 7500 a year suffices for all his needs. It is not difficult to see that, for him, the price attached to amassing a million dollars would seem prohibitive, and the end not worth the gaining. But we must pass from this consideration of what men do and do not want, to the question of what they ought or ought not to want. Of two men, that man who has the more ambition, who is prepared to make the greater sacrifices, must be admitted to have the more willpower. But he is not necessarily the more admirable character. I am all for ambition and success. But what I remonstrate against is the particular kind of ambition and success which is usually held up to the young man of today to emulate. It is usually narrow and material and nearly always selfish. A man ought to set himself as a high goal, and he ought to attach a high value to that goal. Further, he ought not to attach too much importance to obstacles and sacrifices. He should welcome these as challenges to test his mettle. But the goal must be great enough to make the obstacles and sacrifices worthwhile. And it may be questioned whether a purely material and selfish goal does that. What ought a man's goal to be? Stated in the most abstract terms, it ought to be, beyond the mere duty of making himself happy, to increase social well-being, to confer the greatest benefits he can upon humanity. But instead of this, what do nine-tenths of the success writers exhort us to do? They point to the great material successes, the men who have gathered in more engraved paper than other men, the men who have attained fame. And they tell us to ape such as these. It is true that a very large number of successful men in the process of attaining money and fame have incidentally conferred benefits upon mankind. That is one of the ways of acquiring money and fame. In order to get ahead, you may work harder than the man at the desk beside you. You may study at home. You may be more efficient. You may devise plans for saving the firm money. You may patent an invention. And by these methods, adopted primarily that you yourself may get ahead, you are adding to your productivity. You are increasing the world's supply of goods and services. You are conferring benefits upon mankind. Though your end is selfish, you are compelled to help others in order to attain it. In order to persuade people to give you a lot of money, you are obliged to confer equivalent benefits upon them. But if the pursuit of what you call material and narrow and selfish leads to all those beneficial results, someone may ask, what objection can you possibly have to them? My objection, my dear sir, is simply this. So long as fame and money are the ends sought, the benefits conferred upon humanity are mere byproducts. Whereas, in any civilization worthy of the name, the ends sought by individuals ought to be social well-being, and fame and money the byproducts. When money is the end sought, and social well-being merely the byproduct, we produce more money than we need, and not enough well-being. We overeat and overdress, and turn out mountains of silly luxuries. We seek to outdo our neighbors in material display while the enrichment of the mind and the elevation of the soul are ignored, or occupy us only in moments when we have nothing else to do. Material wealth is all very well in its way. A certain amount of it is an indispensable preliminary to any culture of the spirit whatever. Unless a man have enough to eat, his brain will not for very long be able to function. But after we have acquired enough wealth to live in comfort, which does not include silly competitive display, we ought to turn to a higher and better things. I feel like shouting. For God's sake, man, can't you see that the acquisition of wealth is a means and not an end? <sighs> it is further and finally to be said that the man whose sole ambition is to accumulate wealth, and even to do so honestly, must give people what they want, and not necessarily what is good for them. A theatrical manager can gather a fortune by staging salacious plays. There is a moving picture actor with an irresistibly funny way of wiggling his feet. He acquires hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for making people laugh, while college professors starve for trying to make people think. 
Yet after all this, there is something to be said for the ordinary selfish ambition. It is vastly better than no ambition at all. Though the benefits it confers on others may be incidental, it does confer them. And those benefits, even if they are usually material, are often vast. The world would be a very meager place if we lost our selfish ambitions without acquiring altruistic ambitions in their stead. And from the standpoint of willpower, which is, after all, our present subject, there is a very great deal to be said for selfish ambitions. Huxley, in his lecture on scientific education, happens to have said this so well that I cannot do better than quote his words. Quote, I do not wish it to be supposed that, because I happen to be devoted to more or less abstract and unpractical pursuits, I am insensible to the weight which ought to be attached to that which has been said to be the English conception of paradise, namely, getting on. I look upon that getting on is a very important matter indeed. I do not merely mean for the sake of the coarse intangible results of success but because humanity is so constituted that a vast number of us would never be impelled to those stretches of exertion which make us wiser and more capable men if it were not for the absolute necessity of putting on our faculties all the strain they will bear for the purpose of getting on in the most practical sense. End, quote. End of chapter 7. Chapter 8. Controlling One's Thoughts After this ethical interlude on life's ideals, perhaps we had better take our bearings again. We have seen that whatever our ideals, whatever our resolutions, we should, before adopting those resolutions, calmly and coldly count the price of carrying them out. That was our first rule of willpower. Now the second rule follows naturally from the first. Once you have made your decision having coldly decided that this is what you want and that you are willing to pay the price, your decision is forever beyond dispute. You should never ask yourself again whether the other course is possible, whether it is really worth while staying home to study for a specified number of evenings each week, whether a man who has resolved to stop drinking can really do so suddenly without blowing to pieces, whether smoking is really as harmful as you had thought it was, whether a man in a moderate position without so many responsibilities and burdens on his shoulders, doesn't really get just as much enjoyment out of life as the success. Those questions are forever closed. You have asked them before and have decided them. You will know that thoughts determine action, and to control your actions you will begin by controlling your thought. You will vivify all the advantages that will come from carrying out your resolution. You will paint them in glowing colors. You will dwell on them constantly. The disadvantages you will ignore, they are disadvantages only to fools. A wise man does not think them so. Here I need to give a warning. Concentrate on the positive side. Avoid the negative. That is, dwell on the benefits of carrying your resolve out, not on the evils of failing. If you would fight a craving for morphine, do not let your imagination revel in the picture of the ashen-faced, palsied, loathsome, and pitiable creature you would be as a morphine fiend. Picture the upstanding, energetic, healthy-complexioned, respect-compelling man that you are going to be if you refuse it. A morbid, terrible picture is a mind-filling picture. It exerts a strange fascination. If a thought once sufficiently fills the mind, be it never so terrible, unreasonable, or self-destructive, it will be acted upon. I need merely cite the familiar experience of dizziness when looking over a precipice or a high building, or even a low building if there be no rail around. The height from sea level has nothing to do with it, and the height of the potential fall is less important than the actual danger of falling. You grow dizzy because you think of what would happen to you if you lost your balance and fell or even if you were to throw yourself off. The higher the roof or precipice, the more fascinating does this idea become, hence the greater dizziness. It is the very terror of the thought, the reality of the fear that you are going to act upon it, that makes you dizzy. If you could get completely rid of the idea, you would completely lose the dizziness. 
I knew a man living in Buffalo who did not dare to visit Niagara Falls, lest he should throw himself into the magnificent rapids just above them. There are doubtless many like him. Fill the mind with the positive idea of your resolve, and you will carry it out. Some readers will have recognized an affinity between this rule and the doctrine known as suggestion. Little is yet known of suggestion, but enough is known for scientific men to become assured that it is no mere superstition. Practicing physicians recognize its great value. One writer, T. Sharper Nelson, convinced of the theory, has made some pointed remarks on the subject. Quote, We have not to aim at a strong will and wait until it comes. Act as if it had already come. The man who feels he cannot pass a public house without an irresistible temptation to enter and drink to excess must tell himself he can and proceed to walk past the place of temptation. End quote. He suggests a method for combating insomnia. One should say to oneself, I sleep, I sleep, repeating these words until a state of drowsiness is induced. Quote, it is wrong to say, I shall sleep, because that implies desire and hence a possibility of non-fulfillment. Suggestion works by affirmation, not by promise. End quote. My next piece of advice is this. Never defy temptation. Evade it. You may look upon this advice as inconsistent with the above quotation. You may dismiss it as unworthy. I maintain that it is prudent. For urging it, I have the strongest psychologic grounds. In one of his studies in pessimism, Schopenhauer makes a remark to the effect that man has thousands of desires, and as at any moment not more than a few of them are fulfilled, man's existence must necessarily always be miserable. Schopenhauer could only arrive at a conclusion so opposed to common sense because his psychology was defective. Desires are not ever present. Desires are like thoughts. They are thoughts. They come and go. They are aroused by association and suggestion, and less apt to appear when there is no association or suggestion to call them up. I walk along the street. I am, so far as I am consciously aware, content, which is the same thing as being so. But I pass by a fruit stand. I espy some delicious peaches, and there is immediately aroused the desire for peaches. The absence of the fruit then produces in me a maw which must be filled. When I watch an exhibition tennis match, my desire to become a marvelous player is intense. When I go to a skating rink, I attach great value to the personal achievement of expert skating. When I read a book on the history of metaphysics, I desire to become a great philosopher. When I listen to speeches in the midst of a presidential campaign, I fancy that the one thing worthwhile is to become an eminent statesman. Between campaigns, this ambition falls into the background. If I have not been skating for a long time, my desire for preeminence in it fades. The moral of all of this, on its positive side, is to cultivate most your desires for those activities which will best forward your final purposes, those purposes which you have calmly, deliberately, and fully reasoned out. On the negative side, the moral is to avoid all associations, suggestions, lines of thought, which arouse desires that interfere with your final purposes. That is to say, desires that you have resolved against. The drunkard often has a little difficulty in keeping straight, until he sees liquor. Even then he is better able to resist than after he has scented or tasted liquor. If you have resolved forever to cease drinking, do not, to show the strength of your determination, as people do in motion picture dramas, put the red glass to your lips and then set it down. Putting the glass to your lips is liable to be your undoing. Do not raise the glass. Do not order the drink. Do not enter the saloon. If the saloon is directly in line on your way home and habit has dictated your entrance, walk a block out of the way if necessary. Dr. Nolson says that you should tell yourself you can walk past and then do it. That is all very well for the later stages, but I fancy you will find that suggestion and self-faith have their greatest value when not overstrained. You cannot lift a 500-pound weight at arm's length by telling yourself that you can. But by gradual exercises, adding a little bit each week, a man may develop a physique which may enable him to accomplish marvels he never dreamed of before. In the will, 
is just like that. It must be developed slowly. This is not my discovery. Bacon discovered it some three centuries ago, and though his language is somewhat antiquated, his wisdom is as wise today as on the day it was written. Quote, He that seeketh victory over his nature, let him not set himself too great nor too small tasks. For the first will make him dejected by often failings, and the second will make him a small proceeder, though by often prevailings. And at the first let him practice with helps, as swimmers do with bladders or rushes. But after a time, let him practice with disadvantages, as dancers do with thick shoes. For it breeds great perfection, if the practice be harder than the use. End quote. Therefore, it is better to walk around the block a while, if you must, before going past. Then you may have faith, and your faith will be strengthened by the modest record of avoidance behind you. This alcoholic illustration, as I have indicated before, may be legally obsolete, but it is sufficient to indicate to a reader fertile in ideas the application of the principle to any other instance. End of chapter 8